Chapter 19 of The Ghost, a Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 19 The Intercession. Just as I was walking away from the hotel, I perceived Rosa's Victoria drawing up before the portico. She saw me. We exchanged a long look, a look charged with anxious questionings. Then she beckoned to me, and I, as it were suddenly waking from a trance, raised my hat and went to her. Get in, she said without further greeting. We will drive to the Arc de Triomphe and back. I was going to call on Mrs. Sullivan Smith just a visit of etiquette, but I will postpone that. Her manner was constrained, as it had been on the previous day, but I could see that she was striving hard to be natural. For myself, I did not speak. I felt nervous, even irritable, in my love for her. Gradually, however, her presence soothed me, slackened the tension of my system, and I was able to find a faint pleasure in the beauty of the September afternoon and of the girl by my side, in the smooth movement of the carriage, and the general gaiety and colour of the broad tree-lined Champs-Élysées. "'Why do you ask me to drive with you?' I asked her at length, abruptly yet suavely. Amid the noise of the traffic we could converse with the utmost privacy. "'Because I have something to say to you,' she answered, looking straight in front of her. "'Before you say it, one question occurs to me. You are dressed in black. You are mourning for Sir Cyril, your father, who is not even buried. And yet you told me just now that you were paying a mere visit of etiquette to my cousin Emmeline. Is it usual in Paris for ladies in mourning to go out paying calls? But perhaps you had a special object in calling on Emmeline.' I had, she replied at once with dignity, and I did not wish you to know. What was it? Really, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster? Yes, I won't call you Carl any more. I have made a mistake, and it is as well you should hear of it now. I can't love you. I have misunderstood my feelings. What I feel for you is gratitude, not love. I want you to forget me. She was pale and restless. Rosa, I exclaimed warningly. Yes, she continued urgently and feverishly. Forget me. I may seem cruel, but it is best that there should be no beating about the bush. I can't love you. Rosa, I repeated. Go back to London, she went on. You have ambitions. Fulfil them. Work at your profession. Above all, don't think of me. And always remember that though I am very grateful to you, I cannot love you. Never. That isn't true, Rosa, I said quietly. You have invited me into this carriage simply to lie to me. But you are an indifferent liar. It is not your forte. My dear child, do you imagine that I cannot see through your poor little plan? Mrs. Sullivan Smith has been talking to you, and it has occurred to you that if you cast me off, the anger of that, that thing, may be appeased, and I may be saved from the fate that overtook Alresca. You were calling on Emmeline to ask her advice, finally, as she appears to be mixed up in this affair. Then on seeing me, you decided all of a sudden to take your courage in both hands and dismiss me at once. It was heroic of you, Rosa. It was a splendid sacrifice of your self-respect. But it can't be. Nothing is going to disturb my love. If I die under some mysterious influence, then I die. But I shall die loving you, and I shall die absolutely certain that you love me. Her breast heaved, and under the carriage rug her hand found mine and clasped it. We did not look at each other. In a thick voice I called to the coachman to stop. I got out, and the vehicle passed on. If I had stayed with her I should have wept in sight of the whole street. I ate no dinner that evening, but spent the hours in wandering up and down the long, verdurous alleys in the neighbourhood of the Arc de Triomphe. I was sure of Rosa's love, and that thought gave me a certain invigoration. But to be sure of a woman's love when that love means torture and death to you is not a complete and perfect happiness. No, my heart was full of bitterness and despair, and my mind invaded by a miserable weakness. I pitied myself, and at the same time I scorned myself. After all, the ghost had no actual power over me, a ghost cannot stab, cannot throttle, cannot shoot. A ghost can only act upon the mind, 
and if the mind is feeble enough to allow itself to be influenced by an intangible illusion, then... But how futile were such arguments. Whatever the power might be, the fact that the ghost had indeed a power over me was indisputable. All day I had felt the spectral sword of it suspended above my head. My timid footsteps lingering on the way to the hotel sufficiently proved its power. The experiences of the previous night might be merely subjective, conceptions of the imagination, but they were no less real, no less fatal to me on that account. Once I had an idea of not going to the hotel that night at all. But of what use could such an avoidance be? The apparition was bound by no fetters to that terrible sitting room of mine. I might be put to the ordeal anywhere, even here in the thoroughfares of the city, and upon the whole I preferred to return to my lodging. Nay, I was the victim of a positive desire for that scene of my torture. I returned. It was eleven o'clock. The apparition awaited me. But this time it was not seated in the chair. It stood with its back to the window, and its gaze met mine as I entered the room. I did not close the door, and my eyes never left its face. The sneer on its thin lips was bitterer, more devilishly triumphant than before. Erect, motionless, and inexorable, the ghost stood there, and it seemed to say, What is the use of leaving the door open? You dare not escape. You cannot keep away from me. Tonight you shall die of sheer terror. With a wild audacity, I sat down in the very chair which it had occupied and drummed my fingers on the writing table. Then I took off my hat and, with elaborate aim, pitched it onto a neighbouring sofa. I was making a rare pretense of carelessness. But moment by moment, exactly as before, my courage and resolution oozed out of me, drawn away by that mystic presence. Once I got up, filled with a brilliant notion. I would approach the apparition, I would try to touch it. Could I but do so, it would vanish. I felt convinced it would vanish. I got up, as I say, but I did not approach the ghost. I was unable to move forward, held by a nameless dread. I dropped limply back into the chair. The phenomena of the first night repeated themselves, but more intensely, with a more frightful torture. Once again I sought relief from the agony of that gaze by retreating into the bedroom. Once again I was compelled by the same indescribable fear to return. And once again I fell down, smitten by a new and more awful menace, a kind of incredible blasphemy which no human thought can convey. And now the ghost moved mysteriously and ominously towards me. With an instinct of defence, cowed as I was upon the floor, I raised my hand to ward it off. Useless attempt. It came near and nearer, imperceptibly moving. Let me die in peace, I said within my brain. But it would not. Not only must I die, but in order to die I must traverse all the hideous tortures of the soul which that lost spirit had learnt in its dire wanderings. The ghost stood over me, impending like a doom. Then it suddenly looked towards the door, startled, and the door swung on its hinges. A girl entered, a girl dressed in black, her shoulders and bosom gleaming white against the dark attire, a young girl with the heavenliest face on this earth. Casting herself on her knees before the apparition, she raised to that dreadful spectre her countenance, transfigured by the ecstasy of a sublime appeal. It was Rosa. Can I describe what followed? Not adequately, only by imperfect hints. These two faced each other, Rosa and the apparition. She uttered no word, but I, in my stupor, knew that she was interceding with the spectre for my life. Her lovely eyes spoke to it of its old love, its old magnanimity, and in the name of that love and that magnanimity, called upon it to renounce the horrible vengeance of which I was the victim. For long the spectre gazed with stern and formidable impassivity upon the girl. I trembled 
all hope and all despair for the issue. She would not be vanquished. Her love was stronger than its hate. Her love knew not the name of fear. For a thousand nights, so it seemed, the two remained thus, at grips, as it were, in a death struggle. Then, with a reluctant gesture of abdication, the ghost waved a hand. Its terrible features softened into a consent, and slowly it faded away. As I lay there, Rosa bent over me and put her arms round my neck, and I could feel on my face the caress of her hair and the warm baptism of her tears, tears of joy. I raised her gently. I laid her on the sofa, and with a calm, blissful expectancy, awaited the moment when her eyes should open. Ah, I may not set down here the sensation of relief which spread through my being as I realised with every separate brain cell that I was no longer a victim, the doomed slave of an evil and implacable power, but a free man, free to live, free to love, except from the atrocious influences of the nether sphere. I saw that ever since the first encounter in Oxford Street, my existence had been under a shadow, dark and malign and always deepening, and that this shadow was now magically dissipated in the exquisite dawn of a new day. And I gave thanks, not only to fate, but to the divine girl, whom one of those inspirations accorded only to genius, had conceived the method of my enfranchisement, and so nobly carried it out. Our eyelids wavered, and she looked at me. It is gone, she murmured. Yes, I said, the curse is lifted. She smiled, and only our ardent glances spoke. How came you to think of it? I asked. I was sitting in my room after dinner, thinking and thinking, and suddenly I could see this room, and you, and the spectre, as plainly as I see you now. I felt your terror. I knew every thought that was passing in your brain, the anguish of it. And then, and then an idea struck me. I never appealed in vain to Lord Clarenceau in life. Why should I not have appealed now? I threw a wrap over my shoulders and ran out. I didn't take a cab. I ran all the way. I scarcely knew what I was doing, only that I had to save you. Oh, Carl, you are free. Through you, I said. She kissed me, and her kiss had at once the pure passion of a girl and the satisfied solicitude of a mother. Take me home she whispered. Outside the hotel an open carriage happened to be standing. I hailed the driver and we got in. The night was beautifully fine and mild. In the narrow lane of sky left by the high roofs of the street, the stars shone and twinkled with what was to me a new meaning. For I was once more in accord with the universe. I and life were at peace again. Don't let us go straight home said Rosa, as the driver turned towards us for instructions. It seems to me that a drive through Paris would be very enjoyable tonight. And so we told the man to proceed along the quays as far as he could, and then through the Champs-Élysées to the Bois de Boulogne. The Seine slept by its deserted parapets like a silver snake, and only the low rumble of the steam car from Versailles disturbed its slumber. The million lights of the gas lamps, stretching away now and then into the endless vistas of the boulevards, spoke to me of the delicious companionship of humanity from which I had so nearly been snatched away. And the glorious girl by my side, what of her companionship? Ah, that was more than a companionship. It was a perfect intercourse which we shared. No two human beings ever understood one another more absolutely more profoundly than did Rosa and myself. For we had been through the valley and through the flood together. And so it happened that we did not trouble much with conversation. It was our souls, not our mouths, which talked. Talked softly and mysteriously in the gracious stillness and obscurity of that Paris night. I learnt many things during that drive. The depth of her love, the height of her courage, the ecstasy of her bliss. 
and she too, she must have learnt many things from me. The warmth of my gratitude to her. A warmth which was only exceeded by the transcendent fire of my affection. Presently, we had left the borders of the drowsy Seine, which is so busy by day, so strangely silent by night. We crossed the immense Place de la Concorde. Once again we were rolling smoothly along the Champs-Élysées. Only a few hours before we had driven through this very avenue, Rosa and I, but with what different feelings from those which possessed us now. How serene and quiet it was. Occasionally a smooth gliding carriage or a bicyclist flitting by with a Chinese lantern at the head of his machine. That was all. As we approached the summit of the hill where the Arc de Triomphe is, a new phenomenon awaited us. The moon rose, a lovely azure crescent over the houses, and its faint, mild rays were like a benediction upon us. Then we had turned to the left and were in the Bois de Boulogne. We stopped the carriage under the trees which met overhead. The delicately breeze stirred the branches to a crooning murmur. All around was solitude and a sort of hushed expectation. Suddenly Rosa put her hand into mine, and with a simultaneous impulse we got out of the carriage and strolled along a bypath. Carl, she said, I have a secret for you, but you must tell no one. She laughed mischievously. What is it? I answered, calmly smiling. It is that I love you. And she buried her face against my shoulder. Tell me that again, I said, and again, and again. And so under the tall rusting trees we exchanged vows, vows made more sacred by the bitterness of our experience. And then at last, much to the driver's satisfaction, we returned to the carriage and were driven back to the Rue de Rivoli. I gave the man a twenty-franc piece. Certainly the hour was unconsciously late. I bade good night, a reluctant good night, to Rosa at the entrance to her flat. Dearest girl, I said, let us go to England tomorrow. You are almost English, you know. Soon you will be the wife of an Englishman, and there is no place like London. True, she answered, there is no place like London. We'll go. The Opera Comique will manage without me, and I'll accept no more engagements for a very, very long time. Money doesn't matter. You have enough, and I... Oh, Carl, I've got stacks and piles of it. It's so easy, if you have a certain sort of throat like mine, to make more money than you can spend. Yes, I said. We will have a holiday after we are married, and that will be in a fortnight's time. We will go to Devonshire, where the heather is. But, my child, you will be wanting to sing again soon. It is your life. No, she replied. You are my life, aren't you? And after a pause, but perhaps singing is part of my life too. Yes, I shall sing. Then I left her for that night and walked slowly back to my hotel. End of chapter 19 End of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett